Very good to see you all here today. And it's not often that you host a panel where you can say Prime Minister and not know which guest that you're actually referring to. Uh, so for this uh, panel, we'll be using first names. So it's very good to see you, Alex, Davi, and Mickey. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start out with a question for the home team. Uh, last year, your predecessor, uh, Jyrki Kartainen, he said, right now, we have no options but to encourage entrepreneurship. Uh, you've always been a strong advocate of entrepreneurship, uh, but as you alluded to in your opening speech, uh, it's been a tough last 12 months. Looking at Slush 2013 and Slush 2014, uh, how have you seen the differences? Well, I, I think we actually have a really good buzz. I mean, the startup sauna was one of the key components of a startup scene. I think there's been a tremendous change in attitude in Finland. Um, it used to be sort of not okay to succeed and not okay to fail. But with a new sense of entrepreneurship, I think we're changing that around quite well. So we have a whole bunch of smaller and mid-sized companies sort of popping up. Mm. Uh, and I think being quite successful, I think Supercell is one example. There's a lot of stuff going on in the health sector. Mm. There's a lot of stuff actually going on in the forest sector as well, in clean tech, uh, bioenergy and elsewhere. So I, I think we're moving in a better direction. But it's like with anything, you have to be a little bit patient. Uh, you have to wait a little bit and then get things going. But I, I think the scene is much better than what it was 12 months ago. And I, I, I guess Slush is a symbol of it as well. I'd like to expand this question out uh, first to, uh, to Tavi and then to Mickey to also ask, how have you seen the last 12 months in Estonia, Tavi? Has it presented new challenges for you or, or is it too short a time spell to, to, to really say? Well, first of all, let me just say that what a crowd. Uh, <laughs> I have never felt so much as a rock star, but mm -hmm. you guys are the rock stars here, of <laughs> course. Uh, so you rock, really. Inspiring crowd and, and uh, wonderful to be here. Well, I'm usually more into telling what the next 12 months are like, uh, but looking just slightly back, um, I think the startup scene in uh, both Finland and Estonia has developed dramatically. And, uh, we have here a couple of hundred Estonian companies. Half of them were not existent uh, one year ago. And they are a really inspiring crowd. I met uh, many of them uh, early in the morning uh, at the breakfast session. And I really believe that amongst them uh, there are next, uh, next big things as well. But also um, some of our companies have developed, just like the Finnish uh, example is also in Estonia, some of the companies have developed from small startups to, to mid-sized startups, keeping growing, but are already worth uh, hundreds of millions of euros, uh, which is a big thing. Transferwise, CrabCAD, things that are really have gone global already. And I think during the last 12 months, the positive energy of Skype that has been historically our, so, so far, our most successful uh, startup, uh, this positive energy has um, gone to other companies and, and it's really, you can really feel that uh, it's there. And of course, I'm proud to say that Estonia during the last 12 months has achieved the world record of, of having uh, most uh, startups per capita. So this is a positive thing. And yeah, well, actually, we also have a, another world record. This is having the most supermodels per capita <laughs> as well. So go figure if they are related <laughs> in some extent. <laughs> And to you, Mickey. Yeah, so uh, since uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe took his uh, uh, position, uh, I have, have been serving as his, one of his advisory board, uh, which he called the Competitiveness Council. And uh, Japan has dramatically changed. Uh, he has been encouraging more innovation, more change, more deregulation. And uh, of course, the stock market went up like uh, 30%. Uh, I think that we are seeing more and more younger people uh, challenging to start a new company. As uh, one of the leaders in the uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, community, I'm trying to encourage uh, for younger people to become more and more challenging. Uh, so I think it's, uh, uh, we are seeing uh, the new Japan uh, coming up. Uh, Japan has been very famous for the, the quality of the product and the quality of manufacturing. And uh, but we have done many, many innovations, IPS cells, DVD, many, many things are being uh, invented in Japan. But I think uh, 
they are not very good at marketing, in a sense. Um, so I think uh, what I'm trying to encourage Japanese government is we to uh, promote uh, Japan brand as an innovative brand right now. I'd like to follow up on that a little bit as well to, to talk about, it's commonly referred to that Japan lost two decades. And yet, in the middle of those two decades, you started Rakuten, which I believe means optimism, which is a great name for a company at that particular time. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about what it was like to start Rakuten during that time, and also maybe how your experiences as an entrepreneur back then would contrast with what you are trying to set up for entrepreneurs today? I am a very strong believer of the strengths of uh, Japanese uh, economy. Uh, Japanese industry and Japanese society. I think we are very, very teamwork oriented, extremely innovative, uh, and very, very uh, patient. Sometimes too patient. Yeah. So Japanese people do not complain even we are under the, uh, uh, the economic recession for a very long term time. Uh, but uh, I have been very uh, optimistic about the future of Japan. Uh, and because uh, again, uh, we are very, very uh, teamwork oriented uh, and patient. Mm -hmm. And Nakten is all about you know, creating a uh, new business model. Uh, we invented a, a marketplace model. Uh, we were the first company to do so. Uh, we invented uh, the combining e-commerce, media, and online finance. And we have been pursuing the different route uh, than, you know, for example, uh, Google, or Facebook or Alibaba, we have been trying to create, come up with a very, very unique approach. Mm. And how was the market? Did you find it? What were the struggles that you initially had trying to set up back in 1997? What was it that you would like any entrepreneur today to not have to go through that you went through? Well, I think entrepreneurship is all about seeing through the corner, right? You need to see things differently. You don't want to just follow your predecessors, uh, you don't want to follow the big guys. Mm. You need to do some things differently. I started Nakten with two people, uh, never funded by any VC. So the biggest difference between Nakten and the other internet company is I still own like over 45% of the company. Uh, and I never funded by VC. Uh, Try to grow organically. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that has been our strengths. And I would encourage younger people to not, not to just recopy really other company, but come up with a different concept, uh, different business model, uh, based on your own intuition right? and insight. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd just, just like to jump onto that. I mean, there are a lot of people out in the crowd there who have aspiring startups. You know, they're kicking off something big. And um, I just read a really interesting piece by Jim Collins. You know, he's written, I think, six books on, on leadership. And he talks a lot about the way in which companies develop. And he had one of these texts, which was how the mighty fall. And his thesis was that basically what happens is you go through five stages. You know, stage number one is hubris or success. You know, you just keep on growing and everything becomes fantastic and nothing can go wrong. Then stage number two is when you don't think about what you're actually doing, but you just go for this innate growth. Mm. You keep on building up. You don't have a strategy anymore. You sort of go uh, in every direction. Then phase number three is when you sort of see that things are beginning to go sour, mm -hmm. but you are in a denial. So you're sort of saying, no, no, no <laughs> problems for me whatsoever. This, by the way, pertains to countries as well as companies. So it goes sort of hand <laughs> in hand. Then stage number four is what he calls uh, a grasp of salvation or Hail Mary, when you sort of try to do everything to, to, to basically save the company. You probably have a lot of companies in mind already at this stage. And then stage number five, if you don't correct things, is basically death or irrelevance. Now, the good news, I think, with Jim Collins' analysis is twofold. Number one, uh, if you recognize your problems as a company or a country at an early enough stage, you can turn things around. And number two is that if you reach stage number four, where it's sort of Hail Mary grasping for salvation, what you need to do is to be cool, calm, and collected, analyze, go back to your basics, and then renew yourselves. So a lot of, for a lot of the startups over here, you know, whenever you are growing, whenever you're working, don't forget the big picture. Don't forget your values. 
when you're working on things. You, you really have to be self-critical throughout the process. And that's when you emerge from a startup to a successful uh, company. Well, I think it's, it's certainly something that we've seen from Estonia, which I've heard described as a startup country. Um, it's received a huge amount of acclaim, I think, in recent times for its uh, innovation, for its broad ways of thinking. And just a couple of weeks ago, before Slush Today, one of the things that we, we saw coming out of Estonia was what's been dubbed e-residency. Mm. This idea that you, you don't need to live in a country to start a bank account, to start a company. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the thinking behind this and, and your aims and, and what you'd like to achieve? Well, I guess we do some things uh, a startup way. I mean, uh, we are aiming for uh, fast development, both economically and other aspects of the society. And this means also that we, of course, have to learn from others, but we have to, we, we need to have this courage to do things differently, to do things even better. And this sometimes means that others think that we are slightly crazy for doing that, what we do. We have been successful in doing that so far, and, and I, th I, I think this e-residency concept could be very well the next uh, success story, because uh, some say that in Estonia we do have the best um, digital e-services uh, for public sector and, and private sector for that matter. And this actually is based on something that was founded 15 years ago, a long time ago, so 90s. It, and, and this was... Uh, digital secure identification for each and every Estonian. Mm -hmm. and, and once we have had that on, at place, we have been able to build on that all kinds of services, be it um, tax authority, be it uh, health services, be it uh, voting, whatever. Everything can be built on, and pro private services uh, as well. So once we have that in place, uh, there is endless uh, of possibilities. And now our plan is to, of course, encourage other countries to have similar solutions as well. I'm proud to say that Finland and Estonia will probably be the first two countries in the world that offer cross-border this kind of services as well. But uh, before other countries catch up, uh, we are offering our own e-residency for those who live in Japan, for example, live far from Estonia geographically, but they can use this ID card and they can log in to the Estonian system securely and can do any transactions, can, can have their digital signature, which is legally equal to the ordinary signature. So this gives endless possibilities for business and, and cooperation. I think you know, the, the, Estonians are, the Estonians are pioneers on this. And I remember my first visit in this capacity to Tavi's office. The first thing he shows is that He's got no paper in his office. <laughs> then we go to their government meeting room. There's no paper either. And the next thing he does is takes out his pad and shows me his uh, health records, <laughs> which were good, you know, no problem. Uh, they're interested in the rest of it. So what do we do? I mean, we try to tap into Estonia, this X road. We try to work together because they've done a lot of good work uh, in this field. We're also building a big ICT platform, which basically puts in one homepage everything about you, you know, your driver's yeah. license, magistrates, ID, health, insurance, and the rest of it. Does this sort of push paper away? No, of course, you can still use it. But if you can make this in a secure way, it's good. Does, it, does it push you in the direction of something like an e-residency scheme or, or not so much? I hope it would at some stage. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, there is a sense of conservatism as well. Mm. People are afraid of e-residency and what it means. People are even afraid of e-voting, which I think <laughs> is rather crazy because, I mean, if you want people to vote, I mm. think that's a good way of doing it. But there are two things that we're trying to do in Finland right now, and, and, and this is sort of serious stuff. You have to have a big vision. Number one, we want to be the number one startup scene in the world. Mm. And I know it sounds crazy, small country and the rest of it, but a little bit across the bay there in Otaniemi, uh, Keilaniemi, we're trying to create basically space for a lot of startups. Uh, and and you, you know what it is all about. It, it's about creating a buzz. It, it's about creating an incentive for people to come, making it as easy as possible. The number two is we're trying to become the data hub of this part of the world. We're just getting the cable coming through 
uh, the Baltic Sea from Germany, and then we're trying to work it up north as well, because of course, physically, the shortest route to Asia uh, is through Finland. Uh, and this is a way in which we're trying to renew ourselves in one way or another, and Estonia, of course, is an excellent partner in all of this. Well, I think that, that both uh, Estonia and Finland have, have long been commended for a very international attitude, mm. uh, whether that's by design or, or by the fact that it's smaller populations, so uh, companies immediately think international from day one. Um, but it is something that, that's driven uh, the thought processes, I think, of a lot of larger companies. And particularly, you've seen this in Japan with you, Mickey. Um, I know that, that we've seen SoftBank recently invest in Supercell. Um, and yourself, of course, you've brought this, this process of, I believe you, you call it Englishization, uh, to Rakuten, this idea of, of uh, changing the international language of the company. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the thinking behind that and also whether you think it's, it's representative of a, of a wider international um, perspective from, from Japanese com co companies? Right. So uh, Japanese countries, companies has been very successful uh, by exporting their you know, very high quality product whether it's uh, automobile or the you know, electronic machines or um, the computers or materials. The, but, uh, so it, it was more trade-driven, um, uh, the business model, but Rakuten is all about service. So in order to re-globalize our service, our organization needs to become global. Uh, based on that concept, I have been thinking about how we can re-globalize our company and I've, once they came up with the idea, maybe we should change our internal communication language from Japanese to English. Nobody has done this in the, in the past, and, and many people really criticized me for doing that. Uh, some of the really big company CEOs uh, you know, called me crazy, but we decided to do so four years ago. Uh, since then, official language of Dakuten uh, became English. So we do, even among Japanese, uh, we uh, do uh, meetings in English, and uh, that enabled us uh, basically uh, two things. It opened eyes uh, of the Japanese employees. Now they are benchmarking uh, our global competitors and global industrial trends. The second, it enabled us to hire uh, best and brightest from all over the world. 80% of the J engineers we are hiring in Japan are non-Japanese. Uh, some have come from uh, Finland, uh, many from uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, Eastern Europe, China, India. And that diversity uh, is really helping us to become more innovative. Uh, so now Englishization is not just what, part of what we do, it's a kind of a core of, of our growth. I, I really yeah. like that approach. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, it, actually culturally, there's someone from Japan, someone from Estonia, someone from Finland. Funnily enough, we're actually very similar countries. Mm. If you look at our architecture, mm. if you look at our mentality, uh, believe it or not, we are actually quite shy. <laughs> and we open up, it takes a little bit of while. But at the same time, there's a lot of innovation going on with languages and, and otherwise. And what we're trying to do in Finland is to become more and more international that you refer to. By the way, Tavi Roivas is the only non-Finnish prime minister in the world who speaks Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's pretty impressive. Huh? But, but in any case, I mean, in, in, the 19, in 1990, we had 40,000 non-Finnish nationals, internationals here. In 2000, that doubled to 80,000. 2010, 160,000. 2020, it'll be about 320,000. And 230, it'll be about half a million. So that'll be approximately 10% of our population. And we believe in internationalization. Yes, we have a strong Finnish cultural identity, but with languages, we're able to expand. And by creating opportunities, actually like this slush, we can bring in as much innovation and internationals as possible. And language, just like Nikki said, mm. is a great strength in this because most Finns actually speak English. Right. Well, well, I just want to add, this was a but very, very painful uh, process. We're mm -hmm. not talking about uh, you know, very Englishized European country. Well, we are talking uh, Japan. Uh, the, of course, Japanese can read and write uh, English, but they are very shy and they don't want to speak in English. Mm -hmm. And they feel that they kind of feel embarrassed uh, by making mistakes. So I had to encourage 10,000 people 
suddenly to speak in English in front of many, many people, and it was an extremely stressful process. And we, but after four years, I think finally we are even influencing the education program of Japan. Now, Japanese uh, advice prime minister changed the entrance exam of the university from grammar and translation-oriented English to practical English, Good. and the Japanese government is going to do it in 2021. So this is not just about Rakuten. This is about globalizing uh, Japanese industries. I'd like I to have, have notice that all, all the people here, they, they are not typically shy Estonians, typically shy Finns, typically shy Japanese. We, we see people with shiny eyes looking for opportunities, <laughs> interacting with each other. So I think uh, this is the way to go, actually. And, and I, I just like, uh, like you have both said, I, I very much believe in, in openness. Yeah. Uh, as, as small countries, uh, well, the only potential source for prosperity is trading with each other, is being open to each other, to, to be more diverse. And, and uh, tech-related companies have the greatest possibilities to come global just like that. They, they are the fastest uh, developers in, in many aspects. So that's why probably our very open economies are very open to these uh, startup scenes as well. Well, I know that we're running very short on time now, but there's, there's one quick question I'd like to ask all three of you, and you can answer it in a, a serious or a jovial fashion. But having heard about all this sort of international innovation, this, this government innovation, if you, for your own countries, could take up one policy um, from another country, it could be from somebody on this panel, it, it could be from any country in the world, what would you like to be able to pick up and drop into your own politics or your, your own policy uh, that you think could, could be a, a great driver for, for the future growth and prosperity of your countries? And I'll start with Alex. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll say it in a, in, in a serious manner. I'd like to adopt what Estonian, Estonia has done in terms of e-governance. I think we are a year or two mm -hmm. behind Estonia in this front. Uh, and we really need to, mm -hmm. to do that. In the crowd, uh, <laughs> link to that, which is probably not something that I would adopt. I think our kids need to learn coding at mm -hmm. school. Uh, I mean, I'm completely hopeless uh, in coding. I don't understand. I just see the c you know, screen and that's it. But coding is one, and e-governance from Estonia is another one that I'd like to adapt. Uh, Tavi? I think uh, both in uh, Finland and Japan, the core of innovation is very much in place. Uh, Japan was a very, very in innovative country already decades ago. Finland has shown that uh, they can very quickly come from a Nokia country to uh, Angry Birds and mm. app type of country, which means that uh, they are ready for change. They are uh, having this innovation uh, in place. So th the core things, I think, uh, are very well in, in place. And we still have a lot to, to learn from that. But of course, we, we can learn from each other, and, and we should. And finally, to Mickey. Well, there are so many things we need to do, but if I need to pick one, probably a very, very cheap and fast uh, wireless connection. <laughs> uh, either it's uh, free Wi-Fi or uh, 4G or 5G connection. It's too expensive in Japan. Uh, average uh, Japanese people need to spend over 50, 60 euros per month, and it's going to be a very hard button, and then we need to make it cheap and fast. Well. We're over our time, so thank you, everybody, Prime Ministers Thanks. and Mickey. Thank you. Thanks.